Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and today's episode is part two of an hour long's worth of Sam Bazu and Ed Charbonneau talking about Blazor. As I explained uh, previously, they were here taping a bunch of episodes with me. They wanted to do an episode on Blazor. I unfortunately had a conflict I couldn't get out of and Dimitri wasn't available. So we left them alone in the studio and they talked for an hour on Blazor, really good stuff. But we decided an hour's too much, so we cut the episode in half and hopefully the cutting job isn't a little too choppy because uh, we're just going to pick up where they left off now. Let's do file new project. We'll do ASP.NET Core web application again. This time we'll do the full stack okay. version. Now it's important while this spins up, we'll, we'll kind of outline when I say full stack, we're not doing server-side rendering. Okay. So we're still using that client side. Uh, we're going to ship everything to the browser, let it, let it run on WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. We're not doing ahead of time compilation of the views and sending any HTML down the wire other than the bootstrapping index page. Sure. That's it. Uh, so it's something that we just need to clarify right. so people don't expect yeah. that those razors, so uh, yeah. as those razor views are being compiled on the server and mm -hmm. HTML mm -hmm. is being yeah. sent so down the wire. So you're coming back to the server for data, like essentially yes. API endpoints. Yep. So if we look at this, it's exactly what you said. Uh, we have our client app, which is the yep. same exact thing that we saw before. Now we have a server project. Mm -hmm. And the server project has a web API controller. Kay. And this is going to supply that weather data that we saw coming from a static file before. Okay. So it's a web API endpoint with a git um, action on it. Yep. And it's just going to randomize some weather data for us. Yeah, And you can hook this up to any data source you want. It could be yeah. uh, cloud service, yeah. an Azure function, Node.js, all okay. the above. Or uh, SQL Server sitting under my desk. Cognitive services. Sure. Yeah, you could yeah. do some cool machine yeah. learning stuff there. So this is just Web API and I can do CRUD operations like create, read, update, delete. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then notice we have a shared library now. All right. So if we're on the client mm -hmm. and we're going to iterate over a list of uh, weather forecasts. Mm -hmm. So this is the same view that we saw before. An array of weather forecasts is coming in from this git json async. Mm -hmm. And the server sending a uh, list of weather forecasts. Right. Then the weather forecasts can live in a shared location I where see. both projects can access that class type. I see. And is that, uh, like, how would you share? Is that like a .NET standard library? Absolutely. Just, okay. And so this is a .NET standard library. It's being referenced. If I go into my dependencies under projects, oh, there you, go. you okay. can see shared. Yeah. Uh, and it's it is actually using the .NET sure, standard sure. library as so well. So you can reuse this from Xamarin if you wanted to. Yes. Okay. You could share it not only across Blazor projects but any .NET standard sure. project. Yep. And that also opens up this to a whole ecosystem of things that already exist. Mm -hmm. So think about that for a minute. We'll actually have a demo at the very end here where I've gone in and tried some of these things. And like seen existing what NuGet works. packages Absolutely. that you can bring in? Okay. Yep. NuGet's uh, .NET standard packages that are on NuGet, right. um, within reason, they work within Blazor. Now, if they have some kind of direct access to the system, sure. uh, they're, they're looking at you know your system temperature, or re ed, uh, registry, or things that yeah. belong on maybe Windows, not going to happen. Um, what you can do, though, is load in things that are uh, you know, business logic and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Uh, and I'll show a use case for that okay. uh, where it's been successful for me. Okay. So this is the other project. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got the same type of structure, but inside of fetch data, we're actually going out to an endpoint now and right. pulling that data in through an API. We have a shared uh, logic folder. Yeah. Uh, these are all very good things to help us be productive. Sure. So on, in this solution, you could uh, host the server in IIS or anything that you'll host an ASP.NET application in, and then the client could just be served up from anything you want. It's, it's all client side. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, in this scenario, though, the, the client application is actually being served by .NET Core, oh, but you could split those out if you okay. wanted to. All right. Uh, so let's look at another project. I'm going to open this one. This is, I didn't want to do too much live coding here. So I, I know I will uh, fat finger something and we'll have some demo fails. So I, I kind of pre-created uh, it here. Uh, let's do, 
pull it off my start page here. I want to show the concept of having external component libraries. Mm -hmm. So there's currently no file new project experience for creating a component library from within Visual Studio. There is tooling, however. Uh, we can drop down to the command line. We can type in .NET new mm -hmm. blazor lib. So that .NET new blazor lib will spin up a project that is a boilerplate for creating component libraries. Okay, so let, let me back up. You said CLI. So mm -hmm. all of this Blazor stuff, I can do it through CLI as well. Yes. So, and so there's a NuGet, or sorry, there is a. Well, technically, it's a NuGet package. So you can go into your command line. .NET new dash i will install, and then you point to that package, and it I will see. install those command line. And tools if this for is on .NET Core, I can do this on Mac or mm -hmm. Linux, right? Yep. Okay. Just, again, blazor.net and look sure. at getting started. You'll find those CLI commands. Okay. So we don't have to. People don't have to try to memorize them, as we right. say them here on the show. Yep. Uh, that's the best place to find them. Blazor.net. So um, we have our client application, and we have another library called My Components. Mm -hmm. And I have a component in here called My Component, uh, really cleverly named component mm -hmm. here. Um, and I've put that component on my index page. So on my index page, I, I have my component. So you're referencing your component project from inside the Blazor project, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to just render that. Uh, and does the component have other NuGet dependencies that you're pulling in? Um, right now, it's just dependent on the Blazor libraries. So okay. if we look in, uh, in .NET Standard, uh, you see we have our Blazor uh, libraries here. Right. It's dependent on browser and build. If we come into our dependencies on the client application, uh, you can see I have a dependency on sure. my components. And then that dependency is registered in the view imports file. So I here see. it's being registered as a tag helper. Hmm. So this is another familiar concept from our .NET Core, ASP.NET Core uh, mindset. So okay. we, I'm registering any components that exist in the my components library I'm referencing. And that allows me to drop it on my index page. Okay. So let's take a look at what this component does. So this, the code looks almost ex identical to just rendering a component that's inside of your client project. Mm -hmm. But you're just pulling this in. Yep. So I have this big box with a dash line. Most of this is actually boilerplate. I've modified it slightly so we have a cool demo uh, for the show. Um, I've just kind of wired up what already exists in that template. Uh, just to make, give it a little more flair. Sure. So I'm going to click on this box, and now I've got a prompt. Mm -hmm. And I can type anything in here. I'll say, hello, VS Toolbox, and hit OK. And now that data is represented, and it's bound inside of that, that dotted box there. So let's see how that works. So again, my component, look at mycomponent.cshtml. Mm -hmm. It's a simple div. I'm binding to the uh, handle click uh, function handler right. or click handler. Um, it's got a regular CSS class on it of my component. And then I have a value called message. So I'm going to uh, create a placeholder for it. String right. message equals click here to change. That's the default value. And then whenever I click handle click, I'm going to set the message. And this is going to do it asynchronously. Mm -hmm. And it's going to make a call to JavaScript. Hmm. And it's going to display a JavaScript prompt in the browser. Gotcha. So I'm making a call to JavaScript from my C Sharp code. Mm -hmm. And then when that comes back, we're just going to notify Blazor that the state of the view has changed and it needs to do an update to the, the right. Shadow DOM. Now, if I dive in to my component, you'll see this content folder. This is put here by the, the template. And inside of that are resources that belong to the component, sure. including this example JavaScript interrupt. Right. So this is a JavaScript module. And it's being uh, loaded into the global namespace of the window here. So on mm. window, we have our um, scope of example JS function and a function called show prompt. Right. And then that prompt takes uh, an argument of a message. Uh, so we can set that prompt to whatever we want. And then it returns the value sure, sure. Uh, that, that was put into the prompt. So how is the name show prompt different from what you were calling from the JavaScript? I thought you just said prompt. 
okay. in, your, in your components. So there's a nice little wrapper, a piece of syntactic sugar around that. If I open up example JS interop, oh, I see. So there's a little C sharp extension method in here. Mm -hmm. And it's called example JS interop. Uh, sorry, it's not an extension method, just a static method. Right. Um, it's asynchronous, so it uses a task, it returns a task of string, and it takes in the prompt message and returns a string value okay. as a task. So here's where it's calling that scope I see. and then that yeah. function in JavaScript. Okay, so at this point, you're kind of mixing and matching JavaScript and .NET on the client side. Mm -hmm. So if you have existing JavaScript assets and functions, you can call them from .NET. Yes, so okay. if you have existing JavaScript libraries that you love and don't, they're too big to maybe translate over or you want to have a moment where you're migrating you're to... You're in between. Yeah. yeah, okay. So you can do some migration there or WebAssembly may not target certain things yet. So mm -hmm. for example, we can't pull up a prompt natively in C Sharp through WebAssembly, so we need to reach out to JavaScript to say, hey, we need a prompt, and we're able to do that. So we okay. have that flexibility, and this is how it's done. Okay, that's very interesting. And at the same time, we, we got little experience with developing component libraries. Right. And you can see uh, there's no at page directive on this one. Mm -hmm. um, it's just HTML, a little bit of C Sharp and Razor, right. and it's very easy to uh, understand what's happening inside of the system. Right. So let's do the uh, server side uh, example now. Oh, this is where it's, you're going to make it confusing <laughs> for me, aren't you? But let's see. This is interesting. So we've been talking a lot about WebAssembly. We're going to get away from that for a moment. We're going to actually do all this uh, in the browser, or sorry, in the uh, server. Okay. Um, we're going to create a Blazor application that is running on the server, and all of the data is going to be. Uh, handled through a WebSocket. So okay. the, the application on the client is just going to be a very thin client. Mm -hmm. It's just an HTML page that spins up a, uh, a SignalR uh, listener. Connection back to the hub on the mm -hmm. server. Yeah, okay. so there's a hub on the server uh, that's all part of the application framework. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't, we don't really have to concern ourselves with all of that. Um, it looks exactly like the previous few examples. Sure. Let's run this guy. While that spins up, I'm going to fire up yet another application. This is uh, Fiddler by yeah. uh, Progress under the Telerik brand, uh, something that you and I know and yeah, love. Yeah, I mean, most web developers cannot live without Fiddler. And uh, Fiddler is a free uh, tool that you can download and use. Yeah. And uh, it's very helpful for working with uh, HTTP um, connections and things like that. Because I want to show you when we're running this, um, WebSockets kind of perform a little different than uh, your normal requests do. Mm -hmm. So the server has sent down uh, the application through um, the SignalR pipeline. We mm -hmm. have this active connection back to the server, yeah. and we can do uh, updates like this and pull in uh, data from our application. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can do all this using that SignalR hub. Okay. So at this point, this is not running purely client side. You're so there's actually almost nothing running client side in this scenario. So let's actually open this guy up. Uh, let's pull up the network tab. And again, we'll do a reload. Notice all the DLLs aren't coming down this time. No, they're not. Because they're staying on the server. They're running on the server. Um, and we have a small JavaScript file that's handling uh, all of this for us mm -hmm. and just sending back changes through that, uh, that uh, SignalR pipeline. So how does so the server know about the DOM if you had to do anything? So that, that's in the diffs that it's sending back, and I it's see. a binary package it's sending to, to Blazor to, to make those changes. Okay. So for example, if I navigate here, let's clear uh, this window out. And let me come down. Let's go to fetch data. Notice the data loaded. So you the, data is, in the, the data is in here. Mm -hmm. And we didn't make any kind of communication back and forth. Yeah. Let's do the counter component. I'm clicking. There's no communication back and forth. You might, on the surface, think that you're not communicating with the server. Yeah. Let's pull up Fiddler, and uh, hopefully this works for me. I'm 
Let's try to put this side by side. And we'll do a click. And I'm going to demo fail. So let's try clearing our. Oh, is Fiddler responding? Fiddler just, oh, there we go. Something was, some kind of lag here. So let me try again. And for some reason, Fiddler doesn't want to behave with this demo. So we'll have a little demo fail. Um, normally, what we'd have, we'd be able to open this up, and Fiddler would actually show the socket traffic. So DevTools does not capture WebSockets traffic, uh, but Fiddler can. It may, I just don't know where to look if okay. it's there. So yeah. there may be a little bit of uh, my inexperience with the WebSocket traffic in the uh, tooling here. Um, I, it does normally show up in Fiddler, though. Okay. All right. So every time I click this, we're actually, oh, actually, we've, we've frozen up there. When we click this, we're, we're actually sending some traffic through the socket mm. uh, up to the server. OK. Again, that's, this is what happens when you work with experimental bits. Sure. <laughs> Things don't yeah. always happen you didn't pray to the, the way you enough. expect we, we get them the point. to. We get the point. So this is running server side, almost nothing on the client side, and you are piping content through a WebSockets channel or a tunnel, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so one, one other very big difference that you'll notice, remember before when we did our dependency injection on that fetch data, something's a little bit different here. So since we're on the server, we don't need to send an HTTP request. Hmm. So we can just new up a service, forecast right. service. This could be maybe a layer over the top of an AD framework or something like that. But we don't have to send a web request because we're on the server with the data and the application mm -hmm. and all of that. And we can just say, get the forecast, say, synchronously and do it that way. So our dependency injection actually looks different as well. Uh, so we don't, we're not injecting an HTTP client. We're just injecting the service, which is a C sharp class right, that right. we've written. Yeah. So this is interesting. You're, you're hosting the data on the server, and you're also running the app right next to it. So you, you, you can get the data just as quickly mm -hmm. without you can making see, HTTP. Uh, we have our weather forecast service in here, yeah. and um, it's just creating a task, an asynchronous task to turn, return that array. And like I said, that could be your database there. OK. So no HTTP call. Uh, so that's an interesting mode of operation. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's do one last demo uh, where we show a project that, uh, that I've created and used uh, some existing .NET uh, assemblies from NuGet. So let's, oops, I got to stop this guy from running first, and then we'll Let's see if I can grab it off my start page. And I've lost it here. So let's do open uh, project. And the project is called Blaze Down. I figured I'd go with the theme. Sure. Uh, browser <laughs> plus Razor is Blazer. Uh, Markdown plus Blazer is Blaze Down. So let's do a little bit <laughs> of Blaze right. Down. So this is a Markdown editor, okay. completely written in Blazor. Hmm. So I'm going to run this up, and it's a client-side application. It's running on the browser only. Okay. Uh, there's no server code in here. Uh, so we're going to get the application. The browser loads it up. Uh, we have Markdown here on the left, and we have the rendered Markdown here on the right. Okay. So this is a very cheap. Uh, markdown editor that we can just come in here and live edit, and then those changes persist mm -hmm. on the other side. Uh, we can use uh, some of our markdown syntax to change things like headings sure. and do code highlighting, for example. All of those things are, are working here right in the browser um, and being rendered as HTML on the other side. Sure. You might and expect a lot of code behind this, right? Yeah. This is you know, I'm parsing, I'm parsing mark, Markdown into HTML mm -hmm. in real time. And you, are you doing this yourself, or do you bring in some libraries? To I, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the room ever, Sam. So uh, I'm actually using something someone else created. Okay. So there's an existing library called Markdig. Hmm. So there's a dependency in this application. And if I look under Dependencies uh, and under NuGet, 
Uh, we've got something missing here. Oh, it's actually in a component. Sorry, I've moved it out to a component. Uh, so our dependency is in that component itself. So I have a markdown component, uh, NuGet, and mm -hmm. there's markdig. Okay. So this is off the shelf. I haven't modified it in any way, shape, or form. Pulled it into my project mm -hmm. and just started using it right away. I don't know anything about making an H or a markdown parser. And I didn't need to. Somebody already did the hard work for me. Right. I can just pull that into my component. If I open up my component, uh, the component takes and runs a function called build HTML from markdown. Mm -hmm. And I pass in this content value, which is whatever you're typing into right. that text box. Okay. Uh, that runs this function called build HTML from markdown and returns uh, at HTML using this uh, method here called to HTML and sends that back as a string. Okay. And then that string is loaded as raw HTML into the, the component displaying it in the browser. Okay. And all of this is now running client side entirely? This entire thing is running client side. So okay. markdig is running on the browser using the DLLs that come out of NuGet. Mm -hmm. uh, those are actually running right here in the browser. Um, I can do things like uh, pull in, uh, I can use that HTTP client yeah. to pull in markdown files from another resource, mm -hmm. maybe GitHub, right. something like that. Um, I don't know if, if people saw that, I'll clear this out. Uh, I can do import and it'll go back and pull in that original file that I was using before. Um, and then I can also do something cool here. I can say download as markdown. I click that button and I'm prompted uh, with a markdown file. Sure. So, so at this point, you were on the client side and you downloaded a file from the client side that was generated client side as well, right? Mm -hmm. The markdown file. Is that like an output of the markdig uh, so extension? So that's what we're going to get to now. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up, Sam. Uh, I have a download component here. Oh, so there's another component. Uh, there's another component, and this is called download button. Okay. So this component has an on-click event. Uh, that's when you click the actual button itself. Um, it has a property called payload and a property called file name. Mm -hmm. So if we look at our uh, index page here, you'll see uh, the actual component being used, download button here. And I'm setting the value to that same content value, I'm binding. All of these things are just being bound uh, to content value. The markdown mm -hmm. editor itself, the output, mm -hmm. and the button are all binding to the same uh, set of data. Mm -hmm. And then I set the file name to whatever I'd like that to be. Yep. And then when somebody clicks the button, let's look inside of our button. So we go to download button, uh, on clicked event fires, and I'm using a JavaScript interrupt. I see. So the JavaScript interrupt is necessary in this scenario because of browser incompatibilities. Mm -hmm. So I initially wrote this with no JavaScript whatsoever. And you're able to do this in Chrome uh, through um, a special type of URL that you can just set a prompt and click a button and uh, that, that URI translates into a file download. That's not possible on Edge. Edge has a special um, API that is uh, custom for Edge called mm -hmm. MS Save Blob. So I wrote an interrupt that wraps MS Blaves Save Blob. Uh, there's basically a simple browser check. So if I go in here, there's a function in here called uh, is HTML download uh, allowed? And there's also one to say is MS Save Blob allowed? So we check to see is, is MF sa MS Save Blob a function that exists in the browser? If it's not, that means we're probably not on IE mm -hmm. or Edge. Uh, and then it, f it fails over to the next mode, which is yep. this HTML <coughs> download that is more um, universal. And then finally, if no browser support is there, we'll just throw a console message and you won't see that download come across. Okay. So that, that gets invoked when we click that button. Mm -hmm. and, but this project is a good example of how I can use existing .NET technologies, go into NuGet, pull in some packages, write very little code. Almost everything that exists in, the, in BlazeDown, you just saw on the screen. Just a couple properties here and there and a couple function calls. And I'm able to make something really cool like this. Indeed, indeed. 
So that's this is very interesting. It's Blazor in a nutshell right now. 0 0.5.1 is the current release. Uh, it just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it may be updated by uh, when, when the recording comes out on Visual Studio Toolbox. Um, but just uh, check blazor.net for updates sure. and, and see how that turns out. And you're wearing an interesting shirt that nah. says goodbye <laughs> JavaScript, but uh, it, it sounds like you're, we're not really saying goodbye to JavaScript. You can do JavaScript and .NET interop, mm -hmm. but uh, just like JavaScript runs natively in the browser on the client side, now you've got C Sharp running natively in, on the client side as well. Yeah, my, my, my shirt does say goodbye JavaScript, hello C Sharp in Blazor, but I don't wish any you know, bad will towards JavaScript. Of course, it's yeah. still, uh, there's still some great frameworks out there that a lot of people are using. Uh, this is just another option for .NET yeah. developers and people that may want to use .NET for uh, using, doing uh, br uh, web technologies and uh, creating browser-based applications yeah. uh, to use. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, if you are a .NET developer and you, uh, you want to stay on top of modern web, but you don't want to write a whole lot of JavaScript, this is a way for you to write C Sharp straight up in the browser mm -hmm. and run it natively. Uh, what, what about performance? I mean, we are running native performance in the browser. Not yet. So again, this is only like six months old. Sure. Uh, the performance, um, I, I mean, if you look at Blaze Down, it's pretty performant. It, it does a good job. Um, you're not supposed to be using this framework for building production applications because of the state that it's in as an experiment. Sure. Uh, the performance isn't going to be as good as JavaScript at the moment. Okay. Uh, but you know, it's it'll get there over time. At least I, I feel like uh, that's the direction it's headed in. And uh, I, I think Daniel Roth and his team yeah. have a pretty good outlook on what's happening. Yeah, and it sounds like I mean, this is not just a Microsoft or a Google or an Apple thing. As long as WebAssembly gets better at executing those bytecodes, we'll get more and more uh, performance out of it. Yeah, nothing about WebAssembly is Microsoft. Uh, it's the the uh, W3C standard. Mm -hmm. um, it's a standard technology that browsers are implementing. All the other evergreen browsers have it. Other uh, technologies are looking at targeting it. Uh, there's Go compilers, Rust compilers, C++. Uh, so this is just another flavor of WebAssembly and um, a really cool framework built on top of it. Sure thing. So sounds very exciting. Well, what's next? So just keep an eye out on what the ASP.NET team is doing. And Blazor is, is open source now, uh, part of the GitHub repo? Yes. Yeah, so Blazor okay. is open source. Again, Blazor.net or look for it on GitHub. Um, Further down the pipeline, uh, we'll see some uh, some more experimentation. There's actually a project out there of using Electron with Blazor and mm -hmm. using that same SignalR type server side uh, mm -hmm. experience, but it's using um, the Electron shell instead. Um, it's yet another avenue for this cool technology to take off. Uh, and, and the experiments just keep producing really interesting things. So they keep, keep an eye on it. Yeah. Clearly, you're pumped, and I think if you're a C-sharp developer and you want to see where your code can go, uh, definitely keep, uh, I mean, it, it behooves you to kind of keep an eye out on Blazor and where this is heading. Very much. Yeah. Very much so. All right, well, thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge and all the cool stuff that um, uh, the ASP.NET team and Steve Sanderson and Dan Roth and those guys are building. This is very exciting, so we'll uh, see what, uh, what comes out of this and yeah. how this evolves. Yeah, hats off to them. It's uh, it's really cool stuff, and I've just been uh, watching and enjoying you know, all the things they're making and and trying to uh, you know help with issues on GitHub. And if if you get a chance to try this out, um, get the bits, click on the survey button that comes with yeah. the example application, fill out the survey, get in touch with them on GitHub, yeah. let just, them know what yeah. your needs are, so they they know where to steer the framework and sure. how to make and it better. Yeah, I mean, just like anything else in ASP.NET, it's open source and uh, sounds like the community, this is the perfect time for us to play around and make sure we are doing this together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, very exciting, very cool stuff. Uh, so this was all about Blazor on VS Toolbox. Uh, hopefully all of you guys enjoyed it. Uh, keep an eye out on how this evolves. Uh, very exciting times ahead. And thank you so much for being with us on this VS Toolbox show. Thank you and bye for now. So I hope you enjoyed that look at Blazor. It's a revolutionary technology. Uh, it's still experimental, but it, it's got some potential to really change web development. Hope you enjoyed learning about it, and we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.